many of us will remember that little envelope stuffed with papers that served as our medical record with a GP. Record keeping for legal, political and business purposes all followed a similar paper path and it was difficult for anyone to gain access to many of these records and obtain copies without special permission. The computer put an end to that and today data about us in great detail and volume, correct or incorrect, can be exchanged from one machine to another simply and easily <coughs> and is very often without us knowing that it's taking place. Much of the law and regulations to protect the privacy of personal information is now ineffective or limited and new data protection legislation is coming into being. The latest of these is the European General Data Protection Regulation, known as GDPR, and the provisions of which in May have now been adopted directly into Manx law. Now, in today's programme, we shall look at the latest position for the individual, business and other organisations in respect of data protection, and in particular GDPR, as it applies to the Isle of Man. Now, to help us in this complex task, we welcome today's studio guest, the Isle of Man Information Commissioner, Ian MacDonald. It looks as if you've got a, a large job on hand here, the more I read these papers. I would tend to agree with you, Roger. This is quite a uh, significant task that uh, we have in front of us as an office. Yep. And we, at the moment, of course, you must have a relatively small department to deal with it. Uh, at the minute, our, our, my office consists of three and a half people. So, um, yes, we will need to increase our staff. Yeah, well, it depends, of course, on what demand is created by the legislation, I suppose, to extend it. Uh, it's the, uh, some of the obligations in the, in the legislation make it inevitable. But, yes, we are also looking at some of the demand, like you know, because there's things like mandatory data breach reporting now that we've never seen before, that um, that actually already takes up our time and actually between the 25th of May and now we've got and today or certainly Friday we had 33 data breach reports Does this mean somebody hacking somebody? No, data breach reports mean somebody's lost your data in some way it may oh, be right. it could be a hack but it may well be uh, <laughs> apologies about that um, <laughs> no, go on. sorry it may it may, it may well be a, a a hack, um, or it may well be some other sort of loss of data. Um, certainly the breaches that we have seen all do exactly the same thing. Um, some have been mistakes, and some have actually been deliberate actions. Mm -hmm. So, right. Well, let's uh, just set the scene slightly right. here, because after four years of preparation and debate, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR as we shall call it, mm. was finally approved by the EU in Parliament on the 14th of April 2016, with an enforcement date on the 25th of May this year. Now, the purpose was to replace an outdated data protection directive from 1995, that's well before the internet became the online business hub that it is today. It carries provisions that require businesses to protect the personal data and privacy of EU citizens for transactions that occur within EU member states. It also requires the exportation of personal data, and uh, regulates, I should say, the exportation of personal data outside the, the EU. Mm. Well, then, at the June sitting of Tynwald, the Minister for Policy and Reform asked the court to approve the next stage of GDPR regulations, which, amongst other things, would repeal the Data Protection Act of 2002 and establish the Information Commissioner, who is with us today, as the supervisor and his office as the supervisory body for the purposes of GDPR. Well, the motion at that time didn't succeed. There were a number of doubting people in the uh, in the Tynwald. Chris Thomas brought in brought it back to you to July Tynwald for a combined board of keys and council and this time it was successful even though there was st was and still is much unease about the quality of the legislation and its implications so what does it all mean how will it affect or benefit the citizens of the Isle of Man have many people expressed a concern about their personal data how much of it in this is essential 21st century safeguard and how much of it is unnecessary or complex or bewildering and woolly who better to ask is the Information Commissioner, as you've just met him, Ian MacDonald. Ian, what does all this mean for us? <laughs> it's a very good question, Roger. <laughs> um, it is a very, very complex situation, and I, I think what you, uh, your intro probably sums it up perfectly. We've gone from paper records where they were safe, they were secure. We now have computer records and we have global processing where not only can your data be uh, accessed by computer but it can be transferred around the world in 
milliseconds. Mm. Um, so we have a we have a new reality in the twenty first century, uh, and in fact, people refer to data as the new gold or the new oil. Um, it's not quite true, but as people say, co companies like five of the ten biggest companies in the world include Amazon, they include uh, Facebook, they include Alphabet, which is Google, uh, they include Microsoft. So these huge data companies are now some of the richest companies in the world and one of the reasons why they're wealthy is because they have your personal data and use it and use it yes as we see for the, the very famous facebook and cambridge analytica case with the uk information commissioner mm. is still investigating you can see the significance of it and even the potential of it where the use of that data might if they if the claims are correct have influenced the american election well, the OECD in 1980 were on about this. This is not new, is no, it? It's, it's, no. And they came up with a, a number of, they came up with eight fundamental principles in, the, in that period of time. Yeah. Now, have those thing, basic principles changed? Because they, they, were, they all worked upon the right to privacy and the right to know what people are saying yes. about it. Not really. The principles have broadly stayed the same. They have changed in the GDPR, but those eight fundamental principles are still considered to be yeah, workable and, and do what they're supposed to do. This idea that data should be fairly lawf and lawfully processed, should be accurate, etc. And you have the right of access and security of that data. Uh, so they have basically stayed the same even in the GDPR and have translated it into the GDPR. Uh, but what has changed around it was effectively the legislation in the 80s and right, even the 90s legislation, as one people, like one person referred to, he says the enforcement of the legislation was like getting hit over your head with your favourite duvet. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was the problem. There wasn't really effective yeah. enforcement, and without effective enforcement, frankly, a lot of businesses didn't actually really. It, they paid lip service to it rather than actually. Was follow that enforcement it. just in, uh, as it were, in Britain or Europe or America or worldwide? Generally, it would have been worldwide. I mean, there are there are some countries that have had quite quite stringent enforcement. For example, Spain has fined you know companies hundreds of thousands of euros on on many occasions. Um, but generally, no, the enforcement has been quite light. And the GDPR isn't a European initiative, to be perfectly honest. What actually happened in the sort of late 2000s, um, businesses and, and organisations were realising that these old laws were, did not reflect the global economy and the, the global transfer of data. And there was a new international standards document produced in Madrid in 2009, which has subsequently led to the GDPR, and there's similar uh, legislation going on in other places around the world. So what's the principle and purpose of this new stuff? Uh, it's to protect your data. In in the this concept of this new um, global data economy, it's that you get, get some of your control back. Now, unfortunately, I don't realistically believe you'll ever get all your control back, but it's to get you back into control, and particularly at the, the start point, which is what we call transparency, is getting you back to the bit where you know what's happening to your data and that's the first important thing to do uh, to try and achieve anyway I have to say I wouldn't say the first throws of uh, GDPR have been particularly successful because that transparency is what transferred into all those emails that you received mm. just before the 25th of May telling people you what they did with your data um, some of that wasn't correct but what we actually really need to do is see how transparency beds down because it should be something where people are telling you in plain English what your data will be used for. Well, that's, of course, if they do do it. Mm. But I mean, a lot of people, I should imagine, a lot of large outfits, governments indeed, could feel very reluctant to doing that. This is where we've, got, we've now got mm -hmm. to, per to per persuade them with the law that we can do that. And this is where the fines come into play, because the, the whole concept of the fines that are now available inside the GDPR, in the, in the case of the GDPR, not our own version, but on the GDPR version, it's up to 4% of global turnover that a company could be fined. Uh, in the case of our own GDP, um, version, the GDPR here, it's up to a million pounds that a company could be fined. How do you collect it? That's a good question. There is a, there is a penalty notice system which has a court enforcement procedure beyond that, if need be. 
Um, and obviously there's also an appeal mechanism to that as well. I was thinking that, but I can see, see how you might collect it if it was a domestic company. But if it's somewhere in Thailand, you're going to have some troubles, aren't you, with you, connections here? Yeah, this is where data protection authorities now have a thing called the Global Privacy Enforcement Network, which I'm a member of, and we have this ability to um, request the equivalent data protection authority in another country to actually undertake the supervision of it in that country. And, do, and they are there, are they? They're in existence now in most countries. In a lot of countries they now are. It's not, not everywhere yet, um, but it is increasingly coming. And, you know, they, I mean, Japan's now got it, so Vietnam's got got legislation, we, Dubai's got legislation. There's a lot of places around the world increasingly getting their legislation as we speak. So uh, in, lo in May, the laws came into force in the EU. Mm -hmm. And around that time, of course, the EU law effectively law was adopted into Manx legislation lock mm. stock and barrel really wasn't it more or less yes um obviously uh, the decision made by government was that the way they wanted to approach uh, introducing the GDPR was because we have this thing that we need adequacy we want to be able to transfer personal data between here and all the EU member states without any barriers mm. whatsoever um one of the things that you need to have is essentially equivalent legislation and the decision was made to actually more or less adopt, with obviously a few modifications to fit with Manx law, the GDPR by order into Manx law, mm. and that's what they did. But do. So no prime legislation? No, th there is a piece of primary legislation mm. that actually creates the ability to do the orders and then bring implementing regulations below mm. that, but no, there's no primary legislation that has gone through the normal Tinwall process of three readings in the Keys, three readings in Ledgeco before Royal Assent. It seems that throughout the EU that process was there. There was no need for each country to pass any form of legislation. No, be because it is a regulation. This is yeah. the difference between an EU regulation and a directive. A regulation applies to all 28 member states um, as soon as it comes into force. Um, you may well have implementing regulations that actually say how you will actually enforce it but the regulation itself comes into force whereas with a directive it has to be transposed into each EU member state's national law. So does our legislation as we have enacted it ourselves does it differ at all from in any way? Not as far as the GDPR is concerned. The, the, the GDPR order other than giving effect for Manx law so where it said member states, it has things like Manx Law written in it. It is effectively that. We have removed from the legislation bits that don't apply to the island. There's things called a consistency mechanism and things like that that actually have no relevance to the island, so they're not part of that order. So the order has all the essential parts of the GDPR in it. And then what we have is these uh, implementing regulations, which are very similar to the UK Act. With all of this going through here at the moment, there's one question which comes up, of course, with so many different varieties and variations of uh, data and the way it arrives, even on your own computer at home. Mm. How do you define personal data? Personal st data still comes back to this bit, and it actually has a very wide definition. That is one of the things that has actually changed in the GDPR. Um, so whilst personal data is still information that relates to a living individual, who can be identified from that data, it depends what you mean by identification. Because um, your IP address for your computer, there's a there's a big long number mm. when you use your computer that identifies you to other computers. And that IP address is also your personal data. So even your car registration plate, if you own the car, is your personal data. So it has quite a wide uh, definition these days. Yes, well. <laughs> the car number plate, I think, uh, uh, intrigues me, but I don't think anybody's too fussed about the secrecy of that, are they? No, no, they're no, not. No. No, they're not. No. But as far as the exchanges of information and details of information, it, I don't know about most, most people listening today will uh, frequently be bombarded by emails that you don't want. Yes. Now, uh, and a lot of them tend to stem from some sort of contact, even an inquiry that you might have made mm -hmm. some time back, and they never stop pestering you since. Now, is that a breach under the new regulations, or is that just a marketing ploy you're allowed to do? It depends is the answer to that question, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Um, if that marketing required your consent, and all marketing does tend to actually require your consent, but it could be a legitimate interest as well. But if you have the right to object to that, 
And this is one of the things where you can actually turn around and say, no, I do not want to receive this anymore. And if you exercise that right, the controller will actually have to uh, oblige and actually say, okay, I will stop sending you that information. But data must be being exchanged. I know of one organization that auctions the data off its sales website every six months. Yes. Some of these things are probably likely to start. I mean, one of the biggest um, areas where, as you say, data was exchanged, believe it or not, was with charities in the UK. It was mm -hmm. a sort of fairly major um, investigation that the UK Information Commissioner did a couple of years ago where you had donated, donated to a charity and your name and address was being passed on to other charities as, as a potentially good target for donations. Mm. Um, these things you will now have to know about. and it, but, but how will you know about it? Well, this is, brings us back to this transparency yeah. bit, and we have to see how well it works in reality. But mm. under the, the, this new transparency rules that exist inside the GDPR, the, the person who you initially give your information to should be telling you what they're going to do with that information. Now, if they're going to give it to a third party and it's not for any legitimate reason that they require it for in processing, they would actually have to seek your consent and they would actually have to make that consent um, very clear to you. And it'll actually be positive consent as well. It's not, you know, if you don't say no, we're doing it, it'll have to be, yes, I'm happy with that. But so many of these things, sometimes you get a, uh, do you agree to our terms and conditions or do you agree to our, our policy a tick here and there's pages of gobbledygook that are almost incomprehensible and if you don't tick it it doesn't move on yeah. again that's part of what transparency is supposed to do it's supposed to remove that and put it back in the clear plain english that people can understand mm -hmm. um so as i say we wait to see how this actually works out but that's the intention of that piece of that part of the legislation anyway but often very large companies tend to just sit tight and see what's going to happen don't they that is, that does happen. Um, but I can actually say anecdotally from what we've seen over the last couple of years, certainly here on the island anyway, the larger companies have actually been working and they've actually done quite a lot of work. Um, so I, I mean, I would actually say, I would be actually quite pleased with what I've seen on, on many occasions with uh, some of our larger companies. Now we talk, we're, we're talking commercial concerns here. Uh, mm. We are very often we've talked about some of the very large ones, but it wasn't that long ago, was it, that the UK NHS was sharing its data with insurance companies they for were. a price? Yes, um, and that's um, there was the, this. You've got this deep mind at Google Analytica mm -hmm. bit that the Information Commissioner has actually uh, did a report on only about, I think it was about six months ago now. And yes, this is where you've also got to look and go, what are government departments doing or you know, public sector bodies doing as well? Because banks seem to gather a tremendous amount of information. You're not too sure what they want it all for very often. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, anti-money laundering legislation yeah, yeah. where they, they've got to go through their, what they call their customer due diligence. I don't uh, know they wanted the other week my passport number four times. Yes, I mean, again, th th this is a point where people are actually talking about streamlining this system because, yes, the banks require, to, in the opening of the account, they've got to do customer due diligence and they require a, a, some sort of photographic idea of which passport is one. But you can actually say, if they've already got it, do they need it again? Mm. Um, and at the minute, most banks translate their uh, obligations as, yes, they have to take it again. Um, there is an argument, and increasingly that's as part of it. Another piece of legislation is called electronic identification, where people are saying, I can actually get this from here. And it could, would be stored once and, and could be actually then accessed and go, yes, that's you, to stop you having to give it four or five times. Now, you have a power as commissioner now under this new legislation to fine companies, organisations that have not uh, told the line. Yes, there is. Uh, a, you said up to a million, did you say? Yeah, up to a million on the island, it could be up to a million pounds. And that is a discretionary power to your office? It is, a dis it is a discretionary power, but we actually have to publish the scales as to how that would actually work in, in practice. And of course, it'll be, it has to be proportionate. And, you know, so we've got to look at the organisation, the size of the organisation, um, uh, to see whether it's proportionate for the organisation and also proportionate to the nature of what we could perceive to be the breach. And I presume there's a right of appeal. Of course there's a right of appeal. <laughs> yeah. And who who deals with that? The initial appeal is to the tribunal. There's a, a there there, ha, there already is a data protection tribunal. So now you, you've also got all these appeal mechanisms into this tribunal as well. Now, it also seems that you've got some additional powers 
I mean, I have only had a skirt through some of this. It's mm. 140 pages. It takes a bit of doing. It but, does. But as far as I can see, you're given some considerable new powers of the right of entry in people's premises without a warrant. Uh, what what we've been given for the first time is the ability, we've got what's called an assessment notice, uh, where we can actually go in for the first time. Uh, under the current legislation, we really had two powers, an information notice and an enforcement notice. We always had the power of entry and inspection. But um, obviously if somebody said, no, you can't come in, we had to get a warrant. Um, so we've always had the powers of entry and inspection. We now have this other tool called the assessment notice which allows us to say we want to come in and do an audit. So it's no different than so, uh, the Financial S Supervision Commission or um, uh, sort of the Gamma Supervision Commission where they've got audit powers. Right. Now, you have other duties within the department, mm. um, adjudication in respect of the freedom of information, yes. for instance, yeah. or you've taken over some of the high bailiff's current responsibilities. Well, the, the, we, we, when we, we freedom of information came in uh, in 25th, or well, it actually came into force in February 2016, uh, we were also given the ac code of practice to you know, access to government information. So, yes, we have the adjudication power under the... Freedom of Information Act, and we've also got the Code of Practice. Um, strangely enough, we haven't actually had to do anything under the Code of Practice, but uh, we have had quite a few uh, reviews to do under the Freedom of Information Act. So how, in this instance, do you manage, perhaps, it sound, I don't know the exact extent of the duties, this is why I asked no. this question, but it seems to me we've got a potential conflict of interest here. I don't think so. I mean, certainly we've never been there. We've got the data protection side, which it, uh, somebody quite rightly recalled to, uh, called freedom of information as data protection of two sides of the one coin. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably a fair way of looking at it. When, when we're doing freedom of information, we're looking at a government decision to, did it uh, release information or did it withhold the release of information in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act? When we look at on the data protection and subject access requests, we're effectively doing the same thing. Did somebody release information properly or did they withhold it in accordance with the Data Protection Act? But it does seem that within all of this no. um, GDPR we're talking about now, there is a question of the balance of an individual's right to privacy uh, with the legitimate needs of businesses and organisations. That that is part of the part of the process and this is where it will always still remain a grey area what is it you know, there is no doubt there are places and particularly with you you mentioned banks for example you know the rec legal requirement the legal obligation on a bank to actually take your passport detail to prove who you are for customer due diligence so where is the balance uh, um, between that and a person's right to privacy that is always going to be a competing uh, right from what, in the future, from what I can see. Now, you, you have to do very often some sort of auditing. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a recent debate in Tinwold, Laurie Hooper was spending a lot of time talking about the fact that the cost of this audit will fall upon the taxpayer and not on the cost to the company itself. And one perhaps wonders whether it should fall on the company itself in the initial stages if it's if it's uh, an innocent party. But well, yeah, it, this is something we have to that, that has to be looked at. Uh, and indeed, you know, Mr. Hooper brought up, you know, perfectly valid points. Um, if what I need, for example, if we had a, 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 one of our larger companies had a, a hack attack, and so we've got a breach, um, obviously my office doesn't have the skill sets to actually forensically analyse how a company was hacked, you know, the cybersecurity skills. So we would need to get cybersecurity specialists in. And the question is, is who pays for that? So is that paid out of the public purse? Or is that paid by the organisation itself? So th these are one of the things that indeed need to be looked at. Right, now, if you do have to bring in outside people, mm -hmm. government, government has to, you have to incur additional cost when you get mm -hmm. an unusual set of circumstances. And it's not in your budget. It's not in your funds for the year. I presume you, you need Treasury approval. We do. Uh, as it stands at the minute, we would need Treasury approval if we, if we have that additional extra expenditure. And again, that is something that has been highlighted inside government. We haven't got the answer back yet, but they are aware of the issue, and we're waiting to hear what the what the feedback to that is. Maybe unintentionally, but it is a question of independence. Then. It, it is, yes. That's, that's what actually happens, because we have to, again, we come back to this adequacy to concept that we require. 
the other one of the other facets of adequacy is is the independence of the of the regulator on on mm. the, in the particular jur- jurisdiction. So we've got have to have essentially equivalent legislation and an independent regulator, and that's what the commission looks at for adequacy. So yes, that is a question that needs to be looked at, but um, it, yeah, we we have to get an answer to that question. So th- there's quite a lot of unfinished legislative business here yet. There is, uh, and as the Minister for Policy and Reform, Mr Thomas, um, said in Tenwald as well, they are going to replace what we have done with a new piece of legislation within 12 to 18 months. So um, the preliminary work on that has already started. Uh, Hopefully it will be a much tidier piece of legislation and we'll pick up the issues that have been... uh, and that have been actually identified already and addressed. I know this is probably difficult to answer, but it seems to me that uh, there was a bit of a rush. You talk about this has been known this coming for ages, but it seems a bit of a rush within government at the last minute as well. They, they Because this went through at a fair rate of knots. <laughs> yeah, it's probably fair to say that what should have happened was there should be more attention paid to earlier on. Mm. Um, so you could maybe argue that it wasn't a rush, it was the opposite. But... Um, if there'd be more attention paid, it would maybe could have had more time to do other things. Um, but it it came the way it did, and to some extent, there is there is a very good rational e- explanation to it. They waited to see what the UK legislation looked like, and the UK legislation was published in in September of last year. So between September and January, they started to put together the regulations. So it was uh, based on waiting to see what the UK legislation looked like. Well, that's not an unknown process. Yes. But, but having said that, though, having got the first phase through, now we mm. have this order that went through last week, or mm. didn't to start off with, yeah. and then went through last week, uh, last month, in the months, uh, last month. In July, Tim. July, yeah. Tim, yes. Yeah. The, what I find is, the, the, why is that in quite so much of a hurry? The French have a phrase called le droit administratif, which they use all the time, mm. which basically means, right, well, we got to this stage, we know what our obligations are, we'll get around to doing them when we checked it all out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in this case, what we actually had, the the, 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 pr- the reason why uh, the July 10 will you know, brought, put the legislation through is we were sitting slightly in a vacuum. And we have businesses out there doing businesses with EU states. Mm. And it wasn't so much our businesses here. It was those businesses were starting to get nervous. Can I do business with Isle of Man? So it was quite right that the uh, regulations were put through. Um, so we, we have that certainty for business. Business now know that these GDPR order that we talked about is in force. And they can actually talk with their the businesses that they do business with in Europe and say, yeah, Here's our legislation. So we've got a piece of legislation we by order that is accepted by everybody that isn't the final product. It needs mm. a little bit of quite a lot of adjustment and tweaking yet. Not so much the order, the regulations. Regulations, then, yeah. right. Now, you're supposed to enforce the regulations. Mm. So that's put you in an invidious position, hasn't it, knowing that you have an inadequate piece of legislation to work with? Uh, we, we have enough that we can do the job. Um, to do the job... I mean, this was one of the things that I had to analyse, and I sort of went, yes, can I do... The, the question, it, as you just say, is, can I do the functions that I need to do? And the answer is, yes, I can. Can I do the, the functions as well as was envisaged that I could do the job? No. So that's where the tweaks are required. And how long do you think it'll be before you reach the... Uh perfect situation? Oh, I, don't, I mean, is, is there such a thing as perfection? <laughs> I don't know. But... We believe that um, either ten, either the October ten world or the November ten world tweaks will be made to the regulations that will actually make them uh, certainly satisfactory until they actually t- uh, create the new legislation. Okay. Well, now we're going to take a short commercial break. Mm. Ian Macdonald and I will be back in just about three minutes. Sunday opinion this week is concentrating on GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation, that's of the European Union, that came into force on the 25th of May, the provisions of which have now been adopted into Manx legislation. So we've been discussing what does it all mean. And with me to help us through this complex maze of legislation and statutory order is the Isle of Man's Information Commissioner, Ian MacDonald. Now, Ian, there's one thing that, as the conversation goes on, that comes to my mind. I've waded my way through this to try and get my mind around um, quite a bit of it, and, and in the end I've got the principles. But it's there to protect the public. It's there to protect the individual. How on earth does he know what his protection is and to get at it? 
That is one of the tasks of my office because we've got to take that piece of legislation and yeah. translate it into these are your rights and hope and do our equivalent of transparency and actually say in plain English what your what your rights are. Mm. Uh, so that's one of the tasks that we are we have set about, and we are actually on our website already got what your rights are. And of course, we will we uh, as we get the time and the resource to do it, we will actually uh, translate more of the old legislation or our old advice notes into new advice notes. It looks to me sometimes it's a bit like one of these things where this the the te- the, this, the threads go all over the place. I was just thinking straightforward. Then then you go to buy a house, third party contracts. And the date, your personal data, goes all over the place when you're doing that. This is the the reality of the day of the of of the modern era is is your personal data is going in lots of different places, and people are doing back and at the same stage people are doing background checks. As you say, when you go buy a house, people will be doing credit reference checks. They will actually have to do AML checks as well. So there is quite a lot of um, personal data being processed. Now, now, as it is, this is a, so. Will this legislation give protection to everybody in these circumstances? It, uh, where there is legislation that requires that data to be processed, it will be processed. What the data, the th- all the new data protection that legislation does, is actually say, yeah, you can use it for these purposes, but you can't use it for other purposes without the knowledge and the very clear knowledge of the individual concerned. And if need be, if you don't have a le- other legitimate reason to do it, it'll actually, it requires their consent. Well, the notes, this is the European notes, mm. it, it says that it leaves, m- um, leaves much to interpretation. It says that companies must provide a, a reasonable level of protection for personal data, but it doesn't define what constitutes as reasonable. Yeah. So therefore, it says it gives the governing body a lot of leeway when it comes to assessing fines. Yes, uh, as you're probably well aware, when you try to get, or certainly those that follow Brexit understand, when you try to get legislation that 28 member states or 28 very different countries all agree to, you find a lot of fudges, which then actually have to be fixed up in member state legislation. And then, as you say, that actually actually comes back down to the individual regulator. Now, the idea, by the way, um, there is this other body, a consistency body inside of Europe, it's called the European Data Protection Board and that consists of the 28 member states data protection authorities and the idea is that legally that as this goes on, they will actually create the consistency so that there is a consistency in the mechanism later So on. Ireland business is effectively not just regulated here by your department but also by EU authorities almost directly? Um, some of them actually are directly mm-hmm. as well as indirectly. Yes, indirectly because because we've got the order, my interpretation of the GDPR will be very much driven by what the EDPB say. And then there's the other side of it. If you are a, a, an organisation on the island that is offering goods or services to a, a resident in an EU member state, you are directly affected and could be regulated by wherever that resident is. So... Uh, if you're doing business with the UK, you know, and targeting the UK, you could be regulated by the UK Information Commissioner. It gets even more complex now, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. All of the provisions of GDPR will apply to government and the departments. Is that the case? Yes. Yes. So there's there's no opt outs for in the interests of national security or. There are there are still restri- what are called they're now called restrictions, but they they used to be called exemptions. But uh, there are still exemptions for national security. There are still exemptions in certain areas that you know legitimise certain processing, and also say no, you don't have to do this in these particular cases. But so what happens, for instance, if uh, it's a health issue, and there's a committee meeting between a number of doctors and the administrators of the hospital, and you're a subject of that meeting, and uh, can you get the minutes of the meeting under this new regulation? You can get. You have the right of access. You still have the right of access, and that, and the other good news of this is is whereas before you would have had to pay ten pound or fifty pound for a medical record, it's now free, um, and they have to comp- provide it to you within a month rather than forty days. But you can apply for. You can actually certainly request that information, and you have a right of access to your personal data. Now, there is a qualification, the restriction. There are certain restrictions that the a doctor could put on giving you that information if they think or they can actually show as a health professional that it would be, it would cause damage to you to actually provide you with that information. But provided um, 
that exemption wouldn't apply, then you would have the right of access to that information. How long can anyone keep data? Again, the answer to that depends. Um, there are y you start with statutory obligations, for example, tax, national insurance yeah, it returns have to be kept for six years. So there's a there's a, a, a st retention period mm. that's already in law. So uh, you find a lot of the retention periods are put out in law, and in some cases you then look at it and go. I mean, and there are much longer periods than that. You know, there could be some that are legally required for twenty five years and you know and further. Uh, but in our cases, it's a case of, a, of the organisation sitting down and going, how long do I reasonably need this? For example, um, a small business with its um, customer database. It says, you know, if you haven't heard from that customer within two years, do you need to keep their data? Um, and that's the question. The, the answer to that might be yes, the answer may not be no, but it's up to the, that controller, that company to turn around and go, justify its retention policy and why. Unfortunately, government is notorious for delays in issuing information. It's historic. It's not just mm. now. In fact, it used to be almost a policy, especially if it was a tricky question to answer. But, uh, for instance, there's a thing quite recently where um, what used to be the Department of Economic Development now for Enterprise was taken to court by an Ireland resident for he had trouble with it, and, and it found actually in his favour, although he didn't get any compensation. Mm -hmm. But uh, So th there, is a, there is an issue, isn't there, with getting stuff out still? I mean, is, you, you talk about what companies are provided to do, but what are the what are the time penalties on government departments for getting on with it? Right, the same penalties apply to government, but as you say, the, the problem that you have with a government department is is what what happens to fine because the fine just goes straight round. There are other mechanisms because there is this there is an offence of concealing or you not know, providing the information. Um, I have to say that. There is a lot of subject access requests we know go on to government at this moment in time, and the vast majority of them are dealt with and are dealt with inside the time period. So, yes, there are still problems. There's, there's inevitably problems everywhere, but I wouldn't actually say um, government is a, is a particularly bad offender these days. Um, I, I would actually say I'm quite pleased with the responses to requests. and. Well, there are plans, uh, there's all sorts of names being given it, and I've forgotten half of them, but a one-stop shop, effectively one, one yes. record for everybody on, on, on the thing. Now, that in itself must raise data protection issues. It does, yes. Um, very clear data protection issues. Um, th there's two, again, there's two facets to that topic, and that's actually a very good topic. It's a, it's a very, obviously, long topic. But you've got the potential that, of creating Big Brother. And we've got, and you have to recognise that you've got the, the potential of creating Big Brother, and we have to make sure that doesn't happen. But equally, you want to be able to use uh, modern technology efficiently, where it is right to do so. Um, as you say, where it stops you having to provide your detail, your passport details, four, ta four or five <laughs> times. <laughs> well, can we not achieve that? Um, so we are again, but the challenge there is that we've got to get that balance right. Well, I, I say that, but there's, there's, there's more issues there than just the balance of data, isn't there? It? Oh, it's yes. such a large org outfit. One of the issues is security. But, I mean, if, if it's hacked at one level, how, where else will it be hacked? Where will it go? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that this sort of idea of the one-stop shop, the data is not going to be centralised. I mean, I think there was a misconception that people were saying that in the, the idea of that the data would be uh, centralised. It's not. The data is going to stay where it always has been with the different departments. What it is is there'll be another sort of database in the centre that actually holds. Now, my way of describing it is, you will. You, every person would have a key ring, and on that key ring, if need be, you can hang the keys to which are the keys to all the other different systems. And those the, the keys. You won't know that this key is the key, for example, your tax reference number, whilst this key is your health uh, ID number at the, at the hospital. Um, and you won't know which key is which, and you won't know who the key ring belongs to either. It'll just have a number on it that you know, doesn't directly associate. So you would have to hack a lot of system, and it, it would be the equivalent if you took those keys out in the street and you dropped them in the street, nobody would know what they were for. Right. So that's the initial concept in there which does work but we've still got to go to the bit of all the legal gateways that would allow that to happen when it is right to do so so there's going to be an awful lot of work that needs to go on about making that work 
but equally you've got to say this is yeah if you get it right this is good use of technology so you, you you can't turn around and say no let's not do this because you know the concepts of big brother are there yes the concepts of big brother are there it's got we've got what we've got to do is and the task is to make sure big brother doesn't happen and it's used for our benefit and not for our detriment there is a fear and i've heard it expressed a few times mm that where, uh, if it's set up in this way, they can understand that the next door neighbour can't get at your information, but with the right access codes and the right uh, security clearances, there is a worry perhaps that the police might look at something in the health record or the health people might look at something somewhere else. Yeah, we'd, we've got to make sure that doesn't happen. I mean, I, we could, we've already got that in a slight micro because if you think we've got a joint control room, and it's a good example, we've had a joint control room for, what, 15 years now? And when that was being set up, there was always the fear that if, say, a hot, if an ambulance was called to somebody that had had a, a drugs overdose, the police would un hear about that and then go, oh, well, we'll raid that house mm. because it may well have drugs in it. Uh, it hasn't happened because there's been good protocols and good security put up that has prevented it from happening. Um, so we can, that's a perfect example of showing that we can do it and we've done it successfully for 15 years. That's what we talk about today's yeah. digital world and many yeah. people, most people have got phones or they've got an mm. iPad or they've got whatever they've got. There still is a, a core, isn't there, of suspicion with the whole system. Yes, and I, I actually think that, I actually really welcome that suspicion because that's what's needed to make... If we do not have the people with that suspicion and be actively saying, prove to me that you're going to keep my data safe, prove to me mm -hmm. that my data is secure, well, then that's where the risk comes in. Um, because if we don't have those people doing that, um, there is the risk that people would run off into things that uh, may not be to our benefit in the long term. We're just about to go to the news in a few minutes, Ian, and um, I asked you earlier whether you'd like to join us on the Manning Line. We've had some texts and emails in already, but so perhaps um, if we could uh, finish off with any anything we haven't discussed then, um, uh, which is just at quarter past one. The only one quick, quick question I'd like to ask you, because I've only got a few seconds, is all the people listening to this today, I think the question still comes, how can I make use of this system? The first thing is, is you have access to your, you you have the right of access to your own data, yeah. and it's now free, right? And the other thing is, is you should be being told what what is now happening to your information, right. and that's probably the two important things for an individual. Okay, well we maybe come back to that, yeah. out of man in line time because at this point in our conversation we must end Sunday opinion. Our guest has been the Isle of Man Information Commissioner, Ian MacDonald, and we've been discussing the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a European Union regulation, and the effect of its introduction into Manx law. <laughs>